Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath to you and your family. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. Today is a special Sabbath. It's Baptism Sabbath. So we would love for you to join us this evening for a baptism service. The service will be at Hinsdale Adventist Academy at 7 p.m. We would love for you to join us at 6.30 p.m. Please wear your masks. We encourage you to bring your lawn chairs. We will be socially distanced. Everything is laid out for you. So we look forward to you joining us as we celebrate with these young people and their families. For those of you who do not feel comfortable in coming out tonight, for those of you who are high risk, we encourage you to join us through Facebook. You can watch the baptism live through our Hinsdale Philam Church Facebook page. It's called Our Hinsdale Philam Family. That's the same site that Pastor Glenn has used for his Sabbath morning devotional and prayer time with us. And you can enjoy the service live with us. 
We also want to remind our church of our small group Bible studies that we are doing. Since Pastor Glenn has started this new series on the book of Acts, we are doing Bible studies in the evening based on his sermons. So we would love for you to join us. If you go on the church's website, you will see a tab that says Book of Acts. If you click on that tab, you will see a listing of all the meetings, the times, the leaders, and there's a direct Zoom link that you simply have to click on and it will take you to the meeting. We have a Bible study every night of the week and we would love for you to join us. So church, this is a special Sabbath. Please join us in praising God in thanking him for all the blessings and all the good things he's done for us this week. Happy Sabbath. May God bless us as we worship today. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We're just going to lift up our praise to God today. Hallelujah literally means praise God. So we're going to lift up our hallelujah. We're going to lift up our praise to God this morning. Amen. Let's all sing. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah, my weapon is a melody, I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me, I'm gonna sing. Louder and 
Jesus, as we continue to worship you. In this next song, as we sing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. May we know that you are always present, that you are everywhere. And when we sing those words, it's not saying that you weren't there before, but rather we know you're here and that we want you to be here, Jesus. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come, love.
So as we continue our study on the early church in the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit pouring over and into God's people. And I believe, and we know this for a fact, that God's going to do that again. And I believe it's in our lifetime. May we learn to seek and wait for His Spirit. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me yet Jesus, your promise still stands Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your sing that hallelujah amen Jesus you're still enough keep me within your love my heart will sing your praise again your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. your hands this is my confidence you never fail me seen you move.
Jesus, your promises will never fail us. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. I invite you to pray with me as we approach our God and King. Let's pray. We look up to the hills, but where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. So, Father God, we acknowledge that you are the one true God, that you created us. You spoke, and by your word, things came into existence. And so we praise your name. We lift up your name. We just thank you for the Sabbath day that we can spend with you and with our family. And as your children, we acknowledge, Lord, at times we do sin, and so we confess our sins to you. The times when we've put our own agendas or even the world's agendas um, above yours. We put the world's kingdom above your kingdom. And so we confess our sins, Lord, and we know that you are able to forgive us of our sins. Lord, there may be things that are weighing down on us as a people, Some of us are sick and our loved ones are sick. And I just pray that, Lord, you be the healer in their lives. Some of us are struggling financially. Maybe our resources are starting to dwindle. But Lord, we know that you are the provider. You provide for us day by day. And Lord, in our lives, there's some relationships that are strained, God, and that need um, some reconciliation. So I just pray especially for those relationships. Father, you are good, and we just praise you for who you are. Lord, I pray for the pastor. May you be with him. May you give him the spirit. Be with our hearts. Please soften our hearts so that we can um, hear your words uh, clearly. And Lord, as we live in this crazy world where there's a lot of chaos, uh, Father, please put the desire in our hearts to study more, to pray more and desire to be with your people, Lord, so that uh, when the time comes, when we'll we'll be tested, Lord, um, your spirit will be with us and we'll know what to say. And as we continue to that day, we'll be watching, we'll be praying, and we'll keep worshiping your name. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm so glad that you are joining us here this morning and I wish you all the best and just God's peace on this Sabbath day. I I, want to say before I start just a quick shout out to my friends Daniel and Samantha and they've been watching and uh, I love you guys man. So I am so excited to share my second message on this series that I've entitled They Turned the World Upside Down which are actual words that come from the book of Acts, which is, the stu- which is our study here for the next several weeks. Um, we are going to look at the book of Acts because it describes the early church. And I don't know about you, but I have always heard that the end time church, and I believe we are in the end time church, amen? But the end time church is going to look like the early church. And so when I think of that, I think, man, it it would be really, really good for us to look at the early church and to see how we can look more like the early church. So I hope you guys are ready, and I hope you guys are ready to get into this study. Amen? 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for your people. Lord, whether they're watching right now or they're going to watch later, uh, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to them. But first, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through me. Lord, take me and my selfishness and myself out of the picture. May this only be about you and lifting you up, lifting your word up, and lifting your truth up is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, friends, I'm going to teach you a little Greek. I bet, though, that you don't realize that you already know a little Greek. And let me tell you what I mean. When I say the words, the Greek word, harmonia, I bet you think of the English word harmony. See, I told you you knew a little Greek. I bet when I um, share, say the word octo, I bet you're already thinking, oh, that means eight. Or how about the word phobia in Greek? You know that word uh, means fear. Uh, how about this one? Ecclesia, the, the, the Spanish speakers, my Spanish speaking friends. Ecclesia sounds like a lot like Iglesia. And I bet you can connect that that Ecclesia means a church in English. How about this word in Greek? Baptizo. Baptizo. I bet when you hear that word baptizo, you're already thinking, oh yeah, that must mean baptism. And you're right. And I told you, you knew a little Greek. So we're going to look at this word baptizo because baptizo is a really, really special word in the New Testament. Long before baptizo was being used in the church and as a church uh, uh, practice, ancient Greeks were already using this word baptizo. They were already using this is a long term, long, a, a, a long ago term, baptizo. And they were using this word word baptizo, guess where? In ancient Greek recipes for making pickles. That's right, pickles. Now, I love pickles. I don't know if you love pickles, but I love pickles. And, and, and pickles are, are basically fermented cucumbers. But by the way, they're not just cucumbers. They could be other things. Recently, my wife and I looked um, at one of our favorite things to eat, we looked at the health benefits of one of our favorite foods, which is kimchi. <laughs> we love kimchi. And those of you who know me, I love spicy anything. So I, uh, we love kimchi. It's a national dish of Korea. And kimchi is very healthy. It lowers cholesterol. It promotes intestinal health and among other health benefits. What is kimchi? It's basically spicy pickled cabbage or pickled anything. It could be cucumbers also. Here's my point before I start talking about too much food. Here's my point. The word baptize in English is the word baptizo in Greek and it was first used to make pickles. And here's why. When you pickle something, you have to dip it twice. Listen to me now. First you dip it into boiling water and then you dip it into a vinegar salt solution which actually what is, is, is what gives it the flavor. So the process of dipping something twice is called baptizo. Man, I hope you guys are smelling what I'm cooking. The early Christians used that word to describe baptism or getting dipped twice because they knew the truth about baptism and baptism is essentially getting dipped twice. First in water and second by fire or by the Spirit you get dipped twice. That's baptizo. That's why they use that word. Last week we talked a lot about uh, baptism by fire and baptism by water. But let's look again at more of this because this is where Acts really gets its foundation. So let's look at Acts chapter 2 and I want you to see this. I'm going to read Acts chapter 2 just in sections. I'm not going to read the whole thing. So please follow along with me. Acts chapter 2. We're going to read from, what, from verses 1 through 8. Okay? I hope you guys are with me. Acts chapter 2 starting with verse 1. New King James Version. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, 
and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Verse 7, Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Let's stop right there. Stop in verse 8. Now what just happened? The early church came together and they were all filled. They were baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now this is the promise that was fulfilled in Acts chapter 1, right? This was the promise that Jesus gave in Acts chapter 1. It was fulfilled. By the way, I need to tell you this. I don't know how you can read this story and not believe that speaking in tongues means speaking in different languages for others to understand the gospel. Look at verse 6 and 8. It is very, very clear. They understood these tongues. Now, I tell you this because there are some well-meaning Christians, and I mean well-meaning, passionate Christians, who believe that unless you speak in unknown tongues, that you have not been baptized by the Spirit, that you have not received the baptism of the Spirit. And I know because I have friends who believe this, and maybe you have too. And uh, let me tell you, they are honest, sincere Christians. But I don't know how you can read Acts chapter 2 and believe that. I believe that is very clear. That it is, it is not an unknown tongue. They are languages that people understood. Anyway, let's go back. What is the baptism of the Spirit according to Acts chapter 2? If it's not speaking and, uh, and uttering unknown tongues, what is the baptism of the Spirit according to Acts chapter 2? I believe it's this. If you summarize it, I believe it's this. The baptism of the Spirit is the power which gives one someone to live a powerful and victorious Christian life. So at first, the baptism of the Holy Spirit changes your life. Okay? That's, that's very important. It first changes your life. Second, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what gives power to share the gospel. We can't share the gospel without the power of the Holy Spirit, friends. And then the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what gives the power to change lives and change hearts. We can do all the things for Christ that we, that, that, that we think is right and that we know is right, but it, there is no power in it unless the Spirit of God is in it. And the Spirit is the Spirit that changes lives. And that's why we can't give up on anyone. Because the Holy Spirit can change hearts like that. The Holy Spirit can change lives like that. What could take us years to do can take Him moments to do. Amen. So we see here in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 that it is absolutely necessary. Please listen to me. It is absolutely necessary to be dipped twice. To have the baptism by water and the baptism by by the Spirit. Amen. I hope that's clear. I hope and pray that's clear. Let's read on. Verses 14, starting in verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words, for these are not drunk. They thought they were drunk because they were speaking in, in, in uh, tongues. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, or 9 a.m., but this is what was spoken by the prophet Hoel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And, my, and on my manservants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit on those days, and they shall prophesy. Let's stop right there. When you read the book of Acts, you probably don't refer back to the book of Genesis. But today I want you to think about something. And here's the beautiful truth of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, is actually a reversal of the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. You remember that story? In Genesis chapter 11, you have the Tower of Babel. In Acts chapter 2, you have Pentecost. In Genesis chapter 11, you had the people relying on themselves. In Acts chapter 2, you had the people relying only on the Spirit. In Genesis chapter 11, there were people that were trying to build a tower for their own glory. In Acts chapter 2, there was no building, 
and everything was done for God's glory. In Genesis chapter 11, you have, you have the story of and, and confusion of tongues. In Acts chapter 2, you did not have confusion of tongues. You had the miracle of languages. In Genesis chapter 11, you had division among the people. And in Acts chapter 2, you had unity among God's people. In Genesis chapter 11, in the Tower of Babel, no building was actually built. In Acts chapter 2, in Pentecost, the church was built, but no building. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, was the reversal of Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel story. Fascinating study. Pastor J.D. Greer says this, The early church had no building, had no money, and no political power, and they turned the world upside down. You know, I told you something last week that might have shocked you, and you might not even believe it. But I truly believe that one of the reasons why we are not in the building is because God has been trying to teach us that the church is not a building. <laughs> the church is a movement. It is God's people together with a shared vision and a shared purpose, and that is to be a light to the world. Now, let me tell you guys something. This is, this is the truth. Whenever I share this concept that the church is not a building, I guarantee that I will see eyes just kind of glazed over, like, what is he talking about? This is crazy talk. You know, I, this doesn't make sense. I will always get that look. But I'm going to tell you guys right now, I don't care. I'll keep getting that look. I'm going to keep saying this because it's true and it's biblical. The church is not a building. And I'm going to say that until we believe it. The early church had no building. And maybe that's why it's good that right now we're not in a building. Because maybe we can learn what it's really like to be church. Come on, man. I don't know if you guys are with me right now. I don't know if your eyes are glazed over right now. But I need you to hear that. The church is not a building. And Acts chapter 2 was a reversal of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. It was the fulfillment of Hoel chapter 2. And that's, it, it's directly quoting the prophet Hoel. It was the outpouring of God's Spirit, and that was prophesied in Hoel. It happened right here in Acts chapter 2. And so we see Peter's story and what happened. Look at verse 37. So God, the Holy Spirit, came into uh, that room, and Peter was baptized by the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gave him power to speak powerfully the gospel. And then look at, look at uh, verse 37. Look at verse 37. I know we skipped a lot of the chapter, but I just want to get on some highlights. Look at verse 7, 37. So Peter was clearly given the baptism of the Spirit. And when the people heard this, when the people heard Peter's sermon, they were cut to the heart. I and mean, that's something that only the Holy Spirit can do, is talk to people, speak right to them, cut them to the heart, right? And they asked Peter the question, what shall we do? They heard the gospel from Peter, and they're like, what shall we do? In verse 38, Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's two baptisms right there. Repent and be baptized by water, and you will, be, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You, are, you can be baptized by the Spirit. Verse 41, look at verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 people were added to their number that day. That's what the Holy Spirit can do, and that's what the Holy Spirit will do. The Spirit transformed Peter's heart into a willing and powerful servant of God. The Spirit transformed the hearts of the hearers to hear and understand and obey God's Word. That's what the Spirit wants to do, family. And that's what the Spirit still wants to do. Transform our hearts first. Remember, our hearts first before we think that we can go out there and spread the gospel or try to change anyone's anyone else's heart it's our hearts first we transform our hearts into willing and powerful servants and then transform the hearts of those who hear the message or the ones who need to hear the message it is all about the holy spirit and the baptism of the holy spirit that's what we need we don't need another program and we don't need a building we need the Holy Spirit. That's the greatest need in our church and in our life. 
And that's why, like we talked about last week, we need to pray for it and we need to plead for it. We need to continue to pray and plead for the Holy Spirit. All right, let's read the last part of Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 42 to 47. 40, verse 42 all the way to the end, okay? I hope you guys are still with me. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Man, I love the description of what the early church looked like. So I taught you one Greek word already today, and that word is baptizo. I want to end here by teaching you another Greek word, a very important Greek word. I'm going to say it slowly. You can find this Greek word in verse 42. It's the, it's the word for fellowship in Greek, and that is the word koinonia. I'm going to say that again. Koinonia. Say it with me. Koinonia. Koinonia. And koinonia means fellowship, sharing, joint participation. It means community or come to unity. Community, it, it is the word koinonia. Now, what does koinonia look like? You can see that in the story. In verse 42, koinonia looks like when they shared what they learned. They shared food and they shared in their prayers. That's for verse 42. In verse 45, they shared material possessions. They shared their material possessions. Remember, they were getting kicked out of their homes for following Christ. They had to share their things. They had to share their things with each other. Verse 46, they shared in their worship. They shared in their food. They shared their homes and they shared in their joy. Notice something about the early church. Food was mentioned a lot. They loved to eat together. Man, come on, son. Someone, say, someone ought to say amen about that. They loved to eat together. And they ate their bread with simplicity and with joy. They loved to come together to eat together. Man, isn't that something that we can do as a church? I'm not talking about eating together in a grand potluck. I'm talking about we come to each other's homes, we come and visit with each other, and we eat together. How simple is that? We eat together, and we pray together, and we share together. That's koinonia. And what was the result of koinonia? What was the result is that the church grew daily. Friends, would you like to see this in our time? Would you like to see the church grow and multiply like this? Then we don't need to fix or change the recipe. The recipe is right here. It's what the church looked like when it started. We don't have to have grand programs and amazing buildings. We need to come together, get back to the basics, get back to koinonia, when we share the Word of God, and we share our prayers together, and we share food together. Koinonia. It's so simple. Listen to this, please. The early church would have never conceived of a Christian outside of a Christian community. It was a foreign concept. Fellowship, koinonia, was an essential part of being a Christian. There was no such thing as a Christian outside of a community. You know, I'm afraid that most Christians today think of the word fellowship, and they think that's what happens in the fellowship hall. And let me tell you, it is so much more than what happens in the fellowship hall. And maybe that's why God is allowing us not to have a fellowship hall right now because He really wants us to have real fellowship and real koinonia in our homes and opening our hearts to each other in our homes, sharing prayer, having true koinonia, having true fellowship. That's what we need. 
Let me share a true story that was told of a battalion during World War II. And this battalion just couldn't get along. They were always fighting each other. They were so different. They were always going at each other, always constantly fighting. But then this battalion was sent into battle in Europe. And suddenly, these guys who were fighting each other were fighting the real enemy. And they became each other's guardians. They, they became brothers to the point that any one of them would give their life for the other. They discovered that when they faced a common enemy and shared a common cause, they became a band of brothers. And let me tell you, this is the church. This speaks to the church's experience. The church doesn't have time to fight foolish battles when it's busy fighting the real enemy. The church will continue to argue about non-essentials if it's not centered on its mission. It's time to get back to our mission, church. It's time to get back to what the church really is about. And koinonia, koinonia is something that is so special and so true and something that I believe can happen right now. We are not meeting in the church. We are not meeting in a building, but we can have koinonia. And maybe that's why we're not meeting in a building, because we need to have this. God is calling us to koinonia. I'm going to finish with a few quotes. Jackie Hill Perry says, Isolating yourself from community is one way to not guard your heart. You need more eyes than your own to help you walk right. I love that. Isolating yourself com from community, guys, it is dangerous. Let's be careful of that. Vance Havner says this. I love this. <clears throat> Snowflakes are frail, but enough of them, if enough of them get together, they can stop traffic. Let me say that again. Snowflakes are frail, but if enough of them get together, they can, start, they can stop traffic. I love that. Rudyard Kipling says this, For the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. I want to have my revised version on that and say, For the strength of the Christian is the church, and the strength of the church is the Christian. They strengthen each other. They need each other. Brothers and sisters, let's fight the temptation to be isolated, especially during pandemic. It's easy to feel and be isolated and stay isolated. But according to Acts chapter 2, a Christian must be connected to other Christians. The Lord did not intend for us to, to do Christianity alone. That's the purpose of church. We can be together, we can support each other, we can encourage other, each other, we can pray together, and we can break bread together, and we can share the word together. That's the Christian church. So even if we're not meeting regularly or meeting in the building, please, I'm pleading with you, even if we're not meeting in a building, please stay connected. Pick up, pick up the phone and call someone you haven't called in a while. Email someone, text someone. Please don't leave it to the elders and to the pastors. Please, let's do our part to reach out to each other and stay connected. Let's fight. Let's fight the temptation to be isolated. We are a lot like snowflakes. <laughs> we may seem fragile and we may seem not like, like, like we're weak, but if enough of us stick together, we can stop traffic. Let me end with quotes from my favorite author. Lift him up, page 303. Communing together in regard to Christ will strengthen the soul for life's trials and conflicts. I love that. Never think that you can be Christians and yet withdraw yourselves within yourselves. Each one is a part of the great web of humanity and the experience of each will be largely determined by the experience of his associates. What does she say? Communing together in Christ will strengthen you. It will strengthen you. And don't do it alone. That's what she says. Last quote. Last day events, page 190. Listen to this. When the laborers have an abiding Christ in their own souls, when all selfishness is dead, when there is no rivalry, no strife for supremacy, when oneness exists, when they sanctify themselves so that love for one another is seen and felt, then the showers of the grace of the Holy Spirit will just assuredly come upon them. Did you guys hear that? That's a huge if-then statement. She says if and when there is oneness and people get rid of their pride. She says there's no rivalry. When that happens, then 
the Holy Spirit will come upon His church. And so I want to end with this, church, that we need to pray for this to happen right here and right now. We need to pray for three things. I'm going to ask you to pray for three things as I close. Number one, for the sake of receiving the Holy Spirit, if this has to happen before we actually receive the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to pray for this. We need to pray, number one, for the unity of the church. For the unity of the church. And unless we have that, if then, unless we have koinonia, we will not receive the power of the Holy Spirit. That's huge. That is huge. So let's pray for that. Number two, let's pray for those who need to be baptized by water. That's a huge decision. Because being baptized by water means that you are a follower of Christ. You are officially a follower of Christ. And the enemy does not like that decision whatsoever. And the enemy is trying to keep those who need to get baptized by water, trying to keep them away from that decision. We need to pray because that's what is going to break, that's what's going to break hearts uh, uh, and open up hearts to receive this baptism by water and follow Jesus all the way. And then the third thing I'm asking you to pray for is the decision to receive the baptism of the Spirit. I hope that this is clear. Acts chapter 1 and 2 talk about the Holy Spirit. And this is what the church needs. More than anything right now, more than a program, more than a building, more than an event, we need the baptism of the Spirit. Would you help me pray for those three things? Unity, baptism of water, baptism by water, and baptism by the Spirit. And I'm praying that all of you who have heard this message will take this message to heart and it will be something that not only blesses you, but challenges you, challenges you to really wake up to the times that we're in and gives you the urgency to do what the Holy Spirit is calling us to do. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And so God's Spirit is very much present with us here today. Even though we may not see it, even though sometimes we may not feel it, we must hold true to Jesus' promise that He will never leave and never forsake. Jesus said Himself that I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus, you are here through your spirit. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Come on, let's declare who Jesus is. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You. you 
may we have faith to know that Jesus, you're still working in our lives today. benediction um, just want to remind you tonight is gonna be a awesome service I want you to be there could you be there a little early we're gonna start at 7 p.m. but we need you to be there early because we need to space everyone out uh, so that it's safe uh, bring your masks please and bring your lawn chairs and we're gonna have a great time we're gonna have a baptismal service speaking of baptism and we want you there. We need you there. It's going to be a great time together. I believe this is going to be our first, our church's first time to really, really come together in an event like this since uh, the pandemic has started. And it's going to be safe. We're going to be outside, and we're going to celebrate these baptisms. Uh, I hope that you're there, okay? Would you take someone's hand? Take someone's shoulder, if that's more comfortable for you. And let's pray in the spirit of koinonia. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. Lord, your church is, uh, is just in need of your Holy Spirit. We, we know that. We confess that. Lord, uh, forgive us for the times where we focus so much about making it about the church and making it about attraction, attracting. And, and Lord, it's not about that. Lord, it is about us being a movement and us being together and us sharing the word. And Lord... Help us to wake up to the times that we're in. Maybe this is exactly what you needed to happen to your church. And so, Lord, please bless each one. Put that spirit and put that fire within our souls so that we can follow you wholeheartedly. And we can obey and we can share the things that we know. Lord, give us your spirit, Lord. We continue to ask for it, And by faith, we receive it. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, and let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right, so if you're with me, we are going to uh, look at further study of Acts chapter 2. Uh, this is for the small groups, but feel, feel free, even if you're not in a small group, uh, we'd love for you to join one of our small groups, by the way. We have a small group going every night from from Sunday night to Saturday night, except the only night we don't have is Monday night, because that's our meeting night. 
And we, in fact, we have two on Saturday night. So uh, we'd love for you to join one of these. Please, don't do Christianity alone. Please, come on one of these groups and, and get plugged in. So, further study on the book of Acts chapter 2. So, first thing I'd like for you to do is read Acts chapter 2 together. Second thing I'd like you to do is look at verses 1 through 8 closely. And please ask this question. What is the baptism of the Spirit. I want you to come up with your own collective biblical definition. What is the baptism of the Spirit? Number three, I want you to look at verses 14 to 18. I want you to examine the chart that uh, we gave your leaders. I want you to look at Genesis 11, the story of the Tower of Babel, and compare it to Acts chapter 2, the story of Pentecost. I want you to compare all of these things on this chart. I want, to ask you, I want you to ask this question. Why the comparison? What do you think is the message here? Specifically looking at Acts chapter 2 and comparing it to Genesis chapter 11. Why the comparison? What do you think is the message here? Number four, compare the promise in Hoel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, to what happened to the church in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 41. How do we know this was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy? And then lastly, number five. The key word, look at verses 42 to 47 of Acts chapter 2. The key word here is koinonia, or fellowship, or community. What does koinonia look like according to Acts chapter 2, the Acts chapter 2 model? And why? This is the most important question of the, of the, of the study. Why is koinonia so important for us today? Why is Koinonia so important for us today. My friends, fellow Bible students, God bless us as we study His Word. May it open up our hearts and our minds. May it give us the motivation and the courage to do what this says to do. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us today. Those who 
are weary. Though 